Hello everyone. Today I wanted to share something a little bit different with you and this is a book review of Dr. Tatiana's Sex Advice to All Creation and this is what it looks like and it is by Olivia Judson and this book is educational as well as definitely very humorous. So I am just gonna jump right in. What is the purpose of life? From an evolutionary point of view, the purposes of life are clear, survival and reproduction. If you succeed at both, your genes will pass on to your children. And insofar as a particular gene confers an advantage in terms of survival and reproduction, that gene will spread. This simple process is the principal mechanism for evolution. Genetic variation is crucial, but where does it come from? There are two main sources, mutation and sex. Whereas sex produces combinations of genes that already exist, mutation creates altogether new genes. The need to find and seduce a mate is one of the most powerful forces in evolution, and Olivia Judson has dedicated her life to studying the ecstatic diversity of the tactics and stratagems of seduction. In this book, Dr. Tatiana's Sex Advice to All Creation, the author uses a Dear Abby style of writing to cover a range of topics from promiscuity, infidelity, and homosexuality. This book is creative, entertaining, and extremely enlightening, as it reveals when necrophilia is acceptable, how to have a virgin birth, when to eat your lover, and so much more. The book is broken up into three parts. Part 1, Let Slip the Whores of War. Part 2, The Evolution of Depravity. And part three, are men necessary, usually, but not always. Let's jump right in, shall we? Dear Dr. Tatiana, my name's Twiggy and I'm a stick insect. It's with great embarrassment that I write to you while copulating, but my mate and I have been copulating for 10 weeks already. I'm bored out of my skull, yet he shows no sign of flagging. He says it's because he's madly in love with me, but I think he's just plain mad. How can I get him to quit? sick of sex in India. 10 weeks? I can see why you've had enough, Twiggy. Your suspicions are half right. Your paramour is mad, though not with love, but with jealousy. By continuously copulating, he can guarantee that no one will have a chance to get near you. It's a good thing he's only half your length, so he's not too heavy to carry about. Is your case unusual? Well, it is extreme, but by no means unique. Males in many species are fiercely possessive of their mates. The book goes on to list some examples and then discusses Bateman's principle in which he claimed to prove that males are promiscuous and females are chaste. Dear Dr. Tatiana, I'm an orange-rumped honey guide and I own prime real estate, a cliff face that has several giant honeybee nests. Lots of girls visit me and they always let me have sex with them. They say they do it because they love me, but I worry that the real reason is that afterwards they get to gorge on beeswax. Indeed, I'm starting to suspect they act the same with all the guys. Can you reassure me? Honey pot for honeycomb? Sounds like a fair trade to me. After all, you have something they want. Beeswax. And they have something you want. Eggs to be fertilized. Female orange rumped honey guides are not indiscriminate birds. They only mate with males who hold territories. But, I'm afraid to say, the way to a woman's bed is often through her stomach. Females and many other species insist on trading sex for food. Loose females typically eat better and have more offspring. Dear Dr. Tatiana, I prefer to keep my identity secret since I am writing to you not about me or my species, but about my noisy neighbors, a group of chimpanzees. When those girls come into heat, it's enough to make a harlot blush. Yesterday, I saw a girl screw eight different fellows in 15 minutes. Another time, I saw one swing between seven fellows, going at it 84 times in eight days. Why are they such sluts? Mind boggling and eyes popping in the Ivory Coast. The extraordinary promiscuity of female chimpanzees has intrigued many a scientist, and two theories are regularly bandied about. The first is that female chimpanzees mate promiscuously to create competition between sperm from different males. In other words, sperm competition is not merely the consequence of females mating with more than one male, but the cause. I know this sounds outlandish, but it gets wheeled out to excuse the licentious behavior of females in many species, so it's an idea worth scrutinizing. 
Here's how it's supposed to work. The starting assumption is that some males are much better at fertilizing eggs than others. Excellence at fertilizing eggs must have a genetic basis and those genes must be handed on from father to son. Then, females who sleep around will have sons who are better at fertilizing eggs than females who mate only once. The second theory is the obfuscation theory. The idea is that by mating with every guy in sight, females can create confusion over the paternity of their child. Why would this be an advantage? Perhaps a male thinks a child may be his, he will refrain from killing it. Male chimpanzees do sometimes murder infants, so perhaps this reduces the risk of infanticide. So now let's tiptoe into the evolution of depravity. Dear Dr. Tatiana, I'm a burying beetle. I met my wife when we worked together at a chipmunk's funeral. It was love at first sight, and after a whirlwind romance, I thought I'd found paradise. But now she's turned into a frightful harridan. Nag, nag, nag. I don't get a moment's peace, and whenever I try to relax in the evening by doing handstands, she bites me or knocks me over. What have I done to deserve this, and how can I get her off my back? When a male burying beetle stands on his head, he exposes the tip of his abdomen and sends sexy scents wafting into the air. I suspect that when you do your headstands, you're trying to attract a mistress. That's why your wife finds your behavior galling. Look at it from her point of view. The two of you must have struggled to bury that chipmunk. And once the body was interred, you had to remove its fur and massage its poor dead flesh into a ball, ready to feed to your babies when they hatch and crawl out onto the carcass. It's heartwarming to think that these grubs will one day sport shiny black wing covers scalloped with red just like yours. But now, your headstands threaten this blissful scene. Sure, a mistress would be great for you. You would have more children, but it would be a disaster for your wife. The presence of another woman would make it hard for her to raise her children, not only because there might not be enough chipmunk meat to go around, rather the mistress would probably murder and then eat some of your wife's children. Females of many species tend to lose it if their mate takes an additional lover. Dear Dr. Tatiana, my son cuts a fine figure of a manatee and I'm very proud of him. But there's one problem. He keeps kissing other males. What can I do to straighten him out? Signed, Don't Want No Homo in the Florida Keys. It's not your son who needs straightening out, it's you. Some homosexual activity is common for animals of all kinds. Look at the bonobo, a sensual creature also known as the pygmy chimpanzee, which is odd as it's no smaller than the regular chimpanzee. Bonobos like sex and female bonobos like sex with each other. One lies on her back, another climbs on top and they rub genitalia. Among Adelaide penguins, one of the smaller penguins in Antarctica, the males, like most birds, have no penis. But that doesn't stop a bit of gay jiggery-pokery. In one recorded incident, two males bowed to each other as they would to a female, then one lay down on his front, raised his bill and tail like any coquettish girl penguin, and the other copulated with him, ejaculating into his genital tract. They then swapped roles. Or look at dolphins. The bottlenose dolphin is Catholic in its choice of sex partners. Males are frequently sighted copulating with turtles. They insert their penises into the soft tissue at the back of their victim's shell, with sharks and even with eels. Eels? Yes. When a dolphin's penis is erect, it has a hook on the end, and many a male will use it to hook a writhing, struggling eel. So it should be no surprise that males also copulate with each other, inserting their penises into each other's genital slits. The Amazon River dolphin, or bodo, sometimes goes further, penetrating another dolphin's blowhole. So, I wouldn't worry about a little kissing. Why do they do this? Maybe they like it. In the stump-tailed macaw, a gregarious Asian monkey with a guess what, stumpy tail, females achieve orgasm through female-female mounting just as they do from heterosexual copulation. Or maybe it serves a social function. Among baboons, homosexual behavior between males seems to facilitate teamwork. Males who mount each other and fondle each other's genitals are more likely to work together when fighting against other males. Or maybe it has an antisocial function. Among razorbills, northern black and white seabirds that resemble puffins, males mount each other as a display of aggression. Male razor bills do not like being mounted. They never solicit it, nor do they cooperate if it happens. Instead, they either fight back or run away. Males who are mounted a lot become intimidated and give up their efforts to compete for mates. Or maybe homosexual activity springs from desperation. That's the most logical interpretation of a copulation witnessed between two octopuses, not just of the same sex, both male, but of different species. These octopuses live 2,500 meters 
8,000 feet under the sea and presumably meet other octopuses of any sort rather rarely. Almost nothing is known about these particular octopuses. The tryst was the first time that a member of either species had made itself known to science. In general, however, male octopuses do not live long once they mature sexually, so if mates are scarce, perhaps no potential partner should be passed up. And in several species of gull, females are more likely to form pairs with each other when males are scarce. Female couples build a nest together, defend the nest together, and help each other incubate their eggs. The girls mount each other and display to each other as they would to male partners. Neither adopts a male role. In case you're wondering, the eggs are fertilized by males paired to other females in the colony. Female couples are less successful hatching fewer eggs and rearing fewer chicks than conventional pairs. It's better than nothing, however. Without some kind of partner, they wouldn't be able to raise any offspring at all. Lastly, let's take a gander at part three. Are men necessary? Usually, but not always, in which we learn about hermaphrodites. Dear Dr. Tatiana, there's been a frightful accident. I was happily sitting in my usual spot at the bottom of the sea when I felt an itch on my nose. Being a green spoonworm, I don't have arms and I couldn't scratch, so I sniffed instead and I inhaled my husband. I've tried sneezing, but he hasn't reappeared. Is there anything I can do to get him back? Signed, too much heavy breathing near Malta. There, there, it's no use crying over snuffled husbands. He wants to be snuffled, and he's not coming back. By now, he'll have assumed his position in your androsium, literally small man room, a special chamber in your reproductive tract where he can sit and fertilize passing eggs. How does he fit? The little chap is 200,000 times smaller than you. It's as if a human male were no bigger than the eraser on the end of a pencil. You could keep a score of husbands without trouble, but you mustn't disdain your diminutive lover. It's only by chance that you escaped his fate. You see, when a green spoon worm larva first hatches, it has no sex. Instead, its sex is determined by the events of its first days. If, during this time, the larva encounters a female, it becomes a male. If, after about three weeks, it hasn't met a female, it settles into a comfortable crevice and becomes a female itself. This probably sounds amazing, and in many ways it is. However, before talking about the strangeness of your sex life in more detail, I'd like to draw your attention to a phenomenon that's even more peculiar. You'll probably agree that male or female is one of the most basic attributes an organism can have. After all, males and females reliably occur in millions of species. So you might imagine that the way a creature becomes male or female varies little from one species to the next, and that your situation is, in fact, unique. You'd be wrong on both counts. Surprisingly, an organism's sex is determined in ways that vary enormously, and green spoonworms aren't the only ones whose sex is determined by social milieu. Broadly speaking, sex is determined either by genetic or by environmental factors within these two categories. However, there are all sorts of possible variations, many of which have evolved over and over again. For example, one of the most common ways sex is decided is by special chromosomes. Among mammals, males have an X and a Y chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes. For birds, the situation is reversed. Males have two Z chromosomes. Females have one Z and one W. Fruit flies have XY males. Butterflies have ZW females. Lizards swing both ways. Some species have ZW females, others have XY males. It's crazy, and that's just chromosomes. I haven't even mentioned all the critters where the males hatch from unfertilized eggs, a system thought to have evolved at least 17 times, let alone species where sex is determined through horribly complicated interactions of many different genes. What about environmental factors? For many reptiles, what matters is the temperature at which their eggs are incubated, thus in alligators and in still more lizards. You get girls when eggs are buried in cool sand and boys when the sand is warm. For many turtles, it's the other way around. Snapping turtles and crocodiles are even wackier. Eggs buried either in mounds of cool sand or hot sand hatch out girls. Eggs buried in warm sand hatch out boys. More curious still, in Stichococcus sojedity, I probably pronounced that wrong, a tropical insect that sucks the sap of cocoa trees, eggs infected with a particular symbiotic fungus become female. Uninfected eggs become male. And then there are those like you whose sex is determined by social circumstance. For many individuals, this involves changing sex. In one species of Capitella, a worm partial to sewer sludge, males turn into hermaphrodites if they fail to encounter a female within a certain time. In the slipper limpet, 
a notorious pest of oyster beds, everyone starts his career as a male. A fellow who finds himself alone, however, quickly turns into a female and starts attracting mates. Other slipper limpets pile on, gradually forming a loose limpet stack. In slipper limpet sex, it's males on top. Although small, they have splendidly long penises so they can fornicate with the females at the bottom. But as the stack continues to grow, the guys who were once at the top of the heap find themselves in the middle and change sex, reabsorbing their penises in the process to become female. More exotic, the marine worm. If two females find themselves together, the smaller one changes into a male. But because females grow at a slower pace than males, the male will soon become the larger member of the pair. At this point, shazam! Both individuals change sex. Such reversals happen repeatedly. In the end, though, pairs that have been together for a long time end up by both turning into hermaphrodites, an enviable life. As a general rule, flexible gender is expected to evolve whenever an individual's reproductive success as a male, female, or hermaphrodite differs greatly according to circumstances. Social milieu may not be the sole influence at work. If, for example, males can't reproduce successfully unless they are big, it could be an advantageous to start life as a female and become male only on achieving a good size. The ability to choose your sex is particularly handy, however, when being one sex leads to a riskier life than being the other. Which brings me back to you. A female green spoon worm takes a greater gamble in life than a male does. She needs two years to mature, during which she may be eaten by a bat ray, and on reaching adulthood, she may never find a mate. So it makes sense for a larva who meets a female to become male. Not only is he guaranteed a mate, but he can start reproducing as soon as he's installed himself. What is it about you that makes a larva want to be a man? Well, your lovely bulbous body, but particularly your long, twitchy proboscis, secretes a substance known as bonolin after your formal name, bonola viridix. A whiff of bonolin makes any larva stand up straight and fly right. But what you're really dying to know, I suspect, is why your lovers are so minute. What strange circumstances prompt natural selection to reduce a man to a testicle? Two factors are thought to be conspiring here. The first is if females are sedentary. The second, if they are sparsely sprinkled across the landscape. Then a male's biggest challenge is finding a mate. The smaller he is, the faster he can mature. He doesn't have to waste time growing, and the sooner he can start looking. And this size business is not just a quirk of green spoon worms. Lilliputian lovers appear in widely separate groups. Take anglerfish monsters that live in the coldest, deepest seas. The females don't swim much, but float in the darkness, ready to ambush their prey. Like wreckers of old, these formidable girls have special dangles and lanterns to lure the curious to their doom. Victims are swallowed whole, engulfed by toothy mouths and grossly distendable stomachs. Like your hubby, male anglerfish are minute. But these guys win the all-species Serrano de Bergarac Award for the largest nose in proportion to body size. Presumably, the males follow their noses to find females in the vast deep. When they meet one, they bite into her leathery black underbelly and fuse with her body, becoming a permanent appendage, little more than a pair of gonads. Still, it seems to me their fate isn't quite as ignominious as a life sentence in your small man room. The last chapter, Holy Virgin, is written as if the author is hosting a talk show and participants from the audience are having a debate with the guests asking questions about mutation and possible extinction. So this is a thoroughly enjoyable read where the author manages to take a heavy topic of evolutionary biology and turn it into a humorous reading experience where you learn a lot of things you never knew along the way. It hopefully raises awareness and makes you think a little bit more about such controversial ideas regarding homosexuality and monogamy. So again, this is Dr. Tatiana's Sex Advice for All Creation. Very entertaining, very educational. I laughed out loud several times. A quirky, fun read that lets you laugh and learn at the same time. Questions? Let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, as always, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next review.